Hello everyone, welcome to the third day of the Global Forum. Before we start our session, just a quick housekeeping item. This is a multi-language session, so if you would like to hear in another language, you can click on the globe icon on your right, select your language, and then mute the video player to make sure you don't hear the echo on the original language. I hope this is clear. So hello and welcome to the third day of the Global Forum. I'm Julia Bato, the head of labor rights as, at the Institute for Human Rights and Business. If this is your first session in the forum, I hope you enjoy this year's event, which is held in collaboration with the ILO and IOM. If you'd like to catch up with the other sessions, you can have a look in the replace tab on the homepage where you see all the sessions from day one and two. There is also a very active social wall, so please feel free to post your reflections after the session. And the structure of our session today will be brief presentations by the panelists, followed by a Q&A. So if you do have any questions, please send them through the questions box, and we'll have a chance to go through them in a few minutes. Also, do keep an eye on the chat box, where we'll be sharing relevant materials that are relevant for the session. So today I have the honor to be joined by a brilliant team of experts who will discuss their common, their common efforts to promote responsible recruitment and consistent work in the hotel sector in Qatar. I'm delighted to be joined by, by Ms. Sheikha al Qatar, Director at the International Labor Relations Department at the Qatar Ministry of Labor, also known as ADELSA. Mr. Ambed Yusin, General Secretary at Building and Woodworkers International, Mr. Mahmoud Kutu, Executive Director of the Workers' Welfare Department of the Supreme Court of Delivery and Legacy, which is the organization that leads on Qatar's preparations for the 2022 World Cup. Ms. Alex Nasri, Technical Specialist at the ILO. Last but certainly not least, Ms. Rana Aloran, Director of People and Culture at the Four Seasons Doha. And the topic of our session today is particularly relevant in the context of the upcoming World Cup, of course, with hotels in Qatar expected to host hundreds of thousands of fans and football teams, but also in light of the pandemic, which, as we know, has affected the hospitality sector particularly badly, and what is expected from the industry in a post-pandemic world. So as hotels in some locations start to reopen and re-engage workers, what steps can be taken to improve recruitment and employment practices, especially in a sector that encompasses various business models and relies on the outsourcing of a number of services, such as cleaning, landscaping, and security. So in 2019, when meetings in person were still a reality in a pre-pandemic world, the Qatar Ministry of Labor, the ILO, and IHRB embarked in what we thought was actually a relatively small project. And the aim of the project was to promote dialogue and knowledge sharing on responsible recruitment and decent work in the hospitality sector through a multi-stakeholder platform, a working group. Participation would be open to all hotels in Qatar, and we would be inviting mainly human resources directors, the people dealing with workers, recruitment and welfare on a daily basis. So two years later, the collaboration through this group is ongoing and the initiative is actually considered a case of success, certainly not because it managed to solve all the issues, because we know that it takes time and a multi-layered approach to change the way in which business is carried out, not only in Qatar, but globally, but mainly because of the level of engagement that it attracted, the trust that was built and the level of collaboration that emerged from the group. So I'd like to turn to our panelists who will have very interesting reflections to share about this common effort, whether it can be replic replicable anywhere else and what it means in practice to have such a working group. I'm gonna start with you, Ms. al -Kater. As we know, the involvement of the ministry from the very beginning was a crucial element for the success. So I'd like to welcome you to the stage to discuss with me a few issues from the Adelsa perspective. And my first question is the, the expected one, 
if you could tell us a bit about how this collaboration between Adelsa, ILO and IHRB came about, what or who was the driver, and how was hospitality chosen as a, a key sector for collaboration? Over to you, Sheikha. Thank you very much, Julia. Pleasure to participate in the Global Forum for Responsible Recruitment, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak about our engagement with hospitality sector in Qatar. Uh, hospitality is an important sector for Qatar national vision. Uh, the sector represents a significant and growing sector in Qatar with 120 licensed hotels and a concentration of major international hotel brands and high-end properties. There are currently 75,000 workers employed in the sector, both men and women in various occupations and skills uh, levels. Our National Tourism Council projects that the tourism sector's contribution to Qatar total economy will reach 5.2% by 2030 and up to 9.7% of non-hydrocarbon economy. The hospitality sector will be a legacy of the organization of the World Cup uh, 2022 and beyond, as Qatar wants to become a top tourism destination. And as you know, the state of Qatar has adopted a very ambitious program for labor reform. This overall program is part of the National Development Strategy on Labor, which is in turn integrated in the Qatar National Vision 2030. Our aim with this program is to promote decent work and sustainable growth for all workers in the state of Qatar. And in order to support the hospitality sector to adapt to the labor reforms and ensure that the solutions developed are sector specific, the government of Qatar in partnership with ILO, IHRB and the hospitality industry have started since 2018 an innovative collaboration at three levels. First, ADASA created since December 2018 a strategic dialogue group on decent work and sustainable growth in the hospitality sector. This group is composed of national actors, such as the National Tourism Council and the, the Qatar Hospitality, but uh, also of international partners, such as the ILO in Qatar, the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance, the Institute for Human Rights and Business, IHRB, and the global unions such as ITUC, BWI, ITF, and UniGlobal. The Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy and FIFA are also key partners, uh, and they play a central role in bridging the gap between the construction and hospitality sectors, ensuring lessons from constructions are replicated in the hospitality sector. The goal of this strategic group, which meets regularly, is to discuss what are the best strategies to support the hospitality industry in implementing labor rights, and how can coordination be ensured so that collective impact is multiplied in the sector. Second, and in parallel of the strategic uh, dialogue group, ADELSA aims to provide practical guidance to hotels in this phase of rapid legal and policy changes. For this purpose, ADELSA created a working group of hotels human resources directors, which meet, meets every six weeks to discuss specific challenges in the hospitality industry, such as due diligence of recruitment agencies, due diligence of replacement agencies, and how to design efficient grievance handling mechanism, and how to create a joint committee so that workers and management can discuss issues affecting in the workplace. 40 hotels are now represented in the working group. The objective of the group is to openly share challenges and discuss practical solutions to overcome them. Third, ADASA is starting to implement pilot initiatives with hotels on two topics. First, a pilot to test fair recruitment of workers from countries of origin to Qatar, and ensure that workers should not pay any fees of their recruitment to Qatar. Second, pilot to establish joint committees in hotels to ensure workers' representatives are elected and can discuss workplace issues with the management. The object of those pilots is not to support the specific companies, but to deliver, uh, develop good practice and test solution that can th then be extended and promoted in the whole hospitality sector. 
Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much, Sheikha. And I think you talked a little bit about all the very ambitious goals and a lot of the activity that has been um, ongoing in Qatar in the last three years. We know a lot of these goals are very ambitious, especially in terms of the labor reforms that you've been implementing in collaboration with the ILO. So can you talk a little bit about how these reforms also apply to the hotel sector? Uh, all the recent uh, labor reforms uh, implemented by Qatar aim to be inclusive and cover all workers so that no one is uh, left out. Uh, many groundbreaking reforms have been introduced and they, of course, cover workers in the hospitality sector. For example, uh, two new laws uh, dismantling Kapala system were introduced. Workers now are free to terminate and change jobs at any time of their contract, including in the hospitality sector. It will not uh, only allow more flexibility in local recruitment for hotels, it will also ensure more competitiveness of the sector to recruit talents from uh, around the world. Last month, a new non-discriminatory minimum wage entered into force, uh, which will affect positively low-wage occupations in hotels, but uh, is also a protection for workers who might be hired by hotel subcontractors, such as in the security, security sector. Uh, all the other reforms we have been implementing, such as uh, on the establish, uh, establishment of joint committees, also cover the hospitality sector. Thank you. Thank you, Sheha, and I think this is a really interesting overview. And you touched on the multi-layered approach also with the hospitality working group and how you worked with a strategic dialogue group who oversees the work of the hotel's working group. So I'd like to turn to Mr. Ambet now, who from BWI and who's been a part of the, the strategic dialogue group. Um, so Mr. Yusin, how do you see um, this collaborative approach can be beneficial? What are some of the, the, the challenges or some of the lessons learned from this multi-layered approach? Uh, thank you, Julia, and good morning and good afternoon to the participants. Uh, first, I would like to recognize the work of the Ministry of Labor of Qatar, the ILO and the IHRB, in promoting fair recruitment and employment for hotels in Qatar. We have been involved in this process from the very beginning, and we were able to share our concrete experience in the construction sector. And, and I would say, you know, to be direct, you know, collaboration and cooperation is possible in Qatar. You know, BWI, a global union, is welcome in Qatar. To illustrate our positive experience, uh, let me share with you our involvement in the construction industry in Qatar, particularly in the construction of the World Cup Stadium and the major infrastructure projects. We had worked constructively with the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy and the Ministry of Labor, as well as European and Qatari construction company, its main subcontractors, and contractors in addressing the improvement of working and living condition of migrants. In 2016, we signed an agreement with the Supreme Committee for a joint inspection of the stadium construction. We conducted more than 18 joint inspection of the stadium construction sites, the workers' accommodation, looking at the health and safety, enforcement of decent accommodation, compliance to workers' welfare standard, including recruitment. Inspection covers contractors and subcontractors. The inspection is joint together with the Supreme Committee as well as the contractor. The process is not the policing approach of inspection, but more of a collaborative uh, problem-solving approach. Corrective measures are made on the spot. And all parties convene together after the inspection to make collective evaluation, plan of action, and remedies. 
And this, I think, I have seen this in the start of the process of this strategic dialogue group. The, the inspection is also international. BWI affiliates send their international experts, safety officers, inspectors, to be part of the team and lend their expertise using the ILO standard as the basis. The Ministry of Labor has developed the standards and guidelines for hotels. The Supreme Committee has developed workers' welfare standard. What we need now is enforcement, monitoring, evaluation, and providing remedy. I believe that the joint inspection model can be a mechanism for monitoring and problem solving mechanism involving key players in the supply chain in the hospitality sector. When I say key players, it should include the participation of migrant workers through the workers' committees or the global unions that are present now in Qatar. I believe that we have the opportunity to showcase and pilot the hotels that will be used for the World Cup. Thank you so much, Mr. Yusen. And I think you raised a very important and strong point when you mentioned that uh, there is room for constructive collaborative dialogue in Qatar. And I think this is very important to note. You also raised some points about lessons that can be shared from the construction sector with the hotel sector. Um, but I would like to ask, you know, the construction se sector also engages a number of agency workers. There are some similarities with the hotel sector. But based on your experience um, with construction, what are some of the other lessons that can be learned and sort of replicated in the hotel sector? Yeah, th thank you for that. And I, uh, let me give you two examples. No? In the areas of recruitment, I can share with you some exceptional initiative that I encountered in the construction industry, which I considered best practice, if not a model that can be replicated in the hospitality sector, as well as in the other sector, and I would say in the other countries in, in the Gulf region. No? Uh, the first one is the VANC, Work on Responsible Recruitment. You know, Vancy, a French multinational construction company, together with its part, Qatari partner QDVC, has been involved in major infrastructure projects in Qatar, including the construction of uh, the LRT. Vancy and BWI and QDVC signed a framework agreement with the commitment of improving working and living condition of migrant workers in Qatar. This includes commitment to ethical recruitment. In 2019, we conducted an international audit and we have seen significant progress in the area of health and safety, workers' welfare, uh, workers' committees, compliance to employment contracts, uh, providing safety box for every worker to keep their passport. And Vansi provided its workers with no objection certificate. But I want to highlight the significant progress in the recruitment practice of Vansi. The company policy of employing 50% workers are as direct workers. This is exceptional in the construction industry. At the same time, Vansi implemented fair recruitment in their supply chain, no cost in the whole recruitment process, not just recruitment fees, but the whole process of recruitment. Second, reduction of intermediaries in the recruitment process. You know, Vansi and ILO did an impact assessment of the two-year implementation of this fair recruitment pilot project that Vansi implemented. I am very impressed with the result from an average of uh, 3,000 US dollar recruitment fees and other costs. Now it's down to 240 with 90% not paying a single fee. One more important aspect in this project is partnering with recruitment agencies, in this case, 
STS that practices fair recruitment. STS has to change its business model. This model can, can be adapted by the hospitality sector. You know, Alex, Alex have done a lot more work on this. I think she can elaborate more, but I believe that Bansi and the ILO report will soon be available. The second impressive experience we have is the Supreme Committee's Universal Reimbursement Program. You know, recruitment fees is illegal in Qatar, but many workers still pay recruitment fees. But the Supreme Committee, and of course, Mahmoud is directly involved in this, has worked with con contractors to ensure recruitment fears, fees are reimbursed to the workers, even if you don't have proof of payment. I want to recognize the Supreme Committee for this uh, exemplary initiative. As Supreme Committee have reimbursed over 30 million US dollars of uh, recruitment fees to 48,000 workers, of which 30,000 workers are stadium construction workers. What is interesting in this program is that the burden of proof is not on the migrant workers, but on the contractors. So I think this is uh, uh, can be replicated if the hospitality sector can replicate this pro uh, program. I believe that this will have a positive and immediate impact to the migrant workers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Yusun. And I think your example of QDVC, Van C, is perfect. Actually, in the last presentation of day two, so yesterday uh, at the forum, we had a presentation from um, Henriette Macau from Vancy, and she explained all about the pilot, and it was an incredible, um, an incredibly engaging presentation to see the numbers, as you mentioned, the reductions uh, in payments of recruitment fees and, and what it meant for the company itself. So I think this, I would encourage participants to go back and, and listen to that presentation because I think there are certainly a lot of lessons to be learned from it, not just for the hospitality sector, but for all sectors really. In, in your presentation and the interlinkage between hospitality and construction is also the perfect segue for my question to Mr. Kutub, who you know, works with the Supreme Committee, and these are priority sectors in the lead up to the World Cup. So I'd like to ask uh, Mahmoud, the Supreme Committee has been working closely with contractors in, le in the lead up to the Games in 2022. So what are some of the, the expectations that the Supreme Committee has of these contractors and in particular hotels? And how do you see the importance of the sort of collaborative approach that was adopted with the working group in achieving some of these expectations? Over to you, Mahmoud. Thank you, Julia, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, I appreciate this uh, the scene setting, uh, Julia. I'm delighted to be part of this panel. It's very encouraging to see so many people attending this event, which truly really speaks volumes about the relevance and criticality of this topic. Um, of course, Sheikha and uh, Ambit have done a phenomenal job already covering the, the great work that's being done in Qatar currently. Um, we're very proud of the collaboration we've had with both Adelsa as well as BWI. I think we've done some historic work, especially with Ambit and his team. Uh, so if, if, before I begin, for those not familiar with the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, which I'll, I'll refer to as the SC, we are the organization responsible for delivering the tournament uh, infrastructure, particularly the stadiums and the training venues for the FIFA World Cup in 2022. Uh, we believe we're in a very unique position, in fact, to affect change in the hospitality sector. But in order to understand the context of the changes, I think it's important to reflect on the journey so far uh, that we've taken since uh, being awarded the World Cup. Now, from the onset, we understood the responsibility of hosting this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, our region has been afforded a platform to make a real difference and create lasting social change, and, uh, and we seized it uh, from, from the beginning. Uh, shortly after we won the hosting rights, one of the key steps that we took was actually engaging in a multi-stakeholder engagement effort to try to understand the lay of the land, to understand some of the challenges that currently exist within, within the Qatari market, uh, in construction and other sectors, 
um, and with the, with the objective to identify the gaps that may exist and how we could potentially fill, fill those gaps. Uh, this exploratory phase led us to the, uh, publishing our workers' charter in two, 2013. Um, this formed the blueprint for the first edition of the workers' welfare standards that we published, um, which is, has become effectively integrated with our tendering process and is contractually binding. And that's really, really important, I think, right off the bat. And the leverage that we have, obviously, ensuring that the contractors know uh, their responsibility vis-a-vis -vis our requirements, and we have both the carrot and the stick um, to be able to do what we need to do to ensure that there is enforcement and there's compliance. Now, the standards cover three key pillars. I won't get into too much detail. It's effectively ethical recruitment, accommodation, and the work environment. There are three distinct, but very much overlapping, in fact. And both the charter and the standards were issued before a shovel hit the ground on any of our projects. Now, the standards alone, of course, are insufficient and only words on paper if they're, if they're not adequately enforced. And this, we believe, I think, lies at the heart of what constitutes a holistic compliance and audit system. There's a lot of talk currently about the reforms being quite historic and, 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 um, and uh, you know, quite unprecedented in the region. I think the challenge we face today is making sure that there's a comprehensive monitoring and enforcement system to ensure that they succeed. Our solution uh, to this particular challenge was the establishment of what we call a four-tier auditing system. This system puts the responsibility squarely on the shoulders of the contractors to audit themselves and their subcontractors. Uh, then we come in as the Supreme Committee and we all carry out our own independent audits. Uh, third is our independent external monitor, IMPACT, that carries out their own independent audits and inspections and publish their reports. And last but not least, the Ministry of Labor, of course, in their uh, carrying out their legislative duties. We have a dedicated team over at the SC, social auditors and inspectors that carry out 100% audit of the entire supply chain on a revolving quarterly uh, schedule. Now, this is quite unique in the industry, in the construction industry, I, arguably in most industries where third-party monitors typically get leveraged to carry out this work. Um, and since 2014, I mentioned the stadiums and non-competition venues, um, and these are eight stadiums effectively. Now, as we inch closer to 2022, where I believe a lot of the challenges still, still lie, uh, our remit is expanding to focus on the host country operations. These are tournament-centric services, specifically manpower services, construct and there is construction, obviously still, um, not in the stadiums per se. And there's also, of course, professional services, security, catering services. We anticipate about, about approximately 150,000 workers will be required in this particular space. Now, naturally, the hospitality sector will play an essential role in delivering an exceptional experience for all visitors coming to Qatar in 2022. Um, delivering a major sporting event in the 21st century is indeed a global undertaking. In order to succeed, it does require a multitude of stakeholders from differing sectors, including governments, um, NGOs, and the private sector. Of course, all coming together with the responsibility to ensure the welfare of every worker in this particular sector. And I believe this is the commitment to cooperation that we as an organization have shared uh, from the beginning, that shared responsibility, and which I believe really played an instrumental role to our success, um, you know, 10, 10 years since or 11 years since we won the bid. Now, before I delve into the SC's work on the hospitality sector specifically, I'd like to touch on two key challenges that we face. And these are, I believe, are very significant to the theme of the forum and very much have a lot of involvement now in terms of looking at the hospitality sector at large. The first challenge that we tackled, and this is something that Ambit spoke about, I'm not, I won't uh, belabor it too much, but in fact, we're very proud of it, has been on ethical recruitment. There are millions of people, as many of you know, are affected by the charging of unethical recruitment fees. This practice is illegal under international law, under Qatari law, and it's prohibited under our standards. And the majority of workers that we find in Qatar, in fact, have inevitably paid recruitment fees, but they're unable to provide proof. And uh, what Amber touched on is this is something that we, we effectively, um, we, we started the process of negotiation and, and having those discussions, those difficult discussions with the companies and transferred that burden of proof on them to demonstrate that they have hired ethically. Uh, we also understood the economic impact that this will have. This is, this is not easy, especially for local companies. A lot of the small, a lot of the small medium, medium enterprises will be impacted by this. And of course, negotiation didn't, didn't ensue, and it wouldn't have been possible really to have that success without the clear visibility that we have in our supply chain. This is absolutely essential to really have that dialogue. And we approached this, as I mentioned, using the stick and the carrot. Leverage is absolutely key in this particular regard. But we believe that education and awareness has been probably the more effective mechanism that we have used in, in the results that we've achieved. And what Amber touched on 
Uh, that we have now 262 contractors that have bought into the scheme, uh, totaling $28 million, in fact, uh, to SC and non-SC workers. And in fact, uh, a better number that I like to sort of report on is $21 million of the 28 has actually been received in the pockets of workers to date, which makes it a quite a meaningful program. And of course, our external monitor impact does audit and assess, and they do report on these commitments in their annual reports, which I would encourage everyone to, to look at to look at as well. The second major challenge, which I believe is very much tied to the, sec to the first, is the lack of worker empowerment and access to remedy. And of course, we've always believed that giving workers a voice is absolutely necessary. And since Qatar does not allow for trade unions, this was an area we needed to rectify and find solutions quickly and innovatively. And of course, our solution has been our flagship system called the Workers' Welfare Forums. Um, these are effectively forums that allow workers to vote in representatives to speak on their behalf about any concerns that they have. And of course, the issue of recruitment fees, the issue of delayed salaries uh, and other uh, issues, of course, are quite um, these are these are open for discussion during the forums, and in fact, a lot of the issues and concerns that we receive as an organization, when my team is able to deploy and rectify, come through the forum and this this access to remedy that we provided. The forums, of course, you know, we're we're delighted that have they've received some tremendous attention, and again, as part of our commitment to collaboration, we've had several uh, key observers attend. ILO and Modelsa have 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 come and have observed these uh, these forums in action. And they have worked on a model that, that sort of benefits from some of the learnings of the forums uh, with the dispute committees and so on, with the workers' committees, rather. And of course, BWI, in our tremendous collaboration since 2016, have also observed the forums and they have made rec recommendations for their enhancement throughout this journey. Now, the challenges and solutions that I've taken you through have now been transferred over to the hospitality sector. And of course, um, you know, our work in the hospitality sector began in 2019 with 26 hotel operators. Uh, that have engaged into call-off agreements with the Supreme Committee. It's important to mention these are not the same hotels, or in fact, there will be more hotels uh, engaged for the FIFA event, uh, the World Cup in 2022, but this is just an engagement with the Supreme Committee. Um, and our standards, of course, have been embedded into their contracts, uh, giving them the tools to be able to manage their operations ethically and sustainably, and of course, providing us with visibility into their operations. Uh, we have carried out to date roughly 11 uh, audits of 11 hotels, five in an, in an initial pilot and six, which were initiated last quarter. Um, we've clocked in over 150 checks comprising ethical recruitment audits, accommodation and site inspections, which I believe would probably be constitute and become a sort of a key regulator in the hospitality sector to date. And a lot of great learnings have, have been received as a result. And the approach has been the same, really. It's been collaborative, which again, it's the same approach that has been effective in the construction sector. We have applied it for the hospitality sector. And it's, it is definitely worth highlighting that the hotels that we've engaged with so far have been tremendously supportive. They have shown a willingness to find the solutions and address the non-compliance in a systematic, uh, systematic way. Um, to give you some uh, update on progress, you know, we've, the first audit that we carried out was in Q4 2019. Um, since then, we have gone from an average 64% compliance level to about 79%. So that's 15% percentage points increase in compliance. There's been a lot of more awareness around some of the key issues around recruitment, um, uh, around working hours and overtime. But nonetheless, we are still in the early stages. And of course, challenges will, challenges will exist uh, as the journey is ongoing. Um, we have also worked very, very closely with the ILO and Adelsa as well as part of the toolkit that they have produced for the hospitality sector. This important work, coupled with our in-depth due diligence program, I think gives you both a top-down and a bottoms-up approach to tackling the challenges that exist in the sector. Uh, progress has been made around specific challenges. In fact, um, in relation to the first challenges around rec ethical recruitment, some hotel operators have already initiated the process of terminating their existing unregistered recruitment agents, and they are now taking steps to enter into agreements with the Ministry of Labor registered agencies. Uh, we've also identified one particular hotel that actually stands out and has adopted a direct hiring scheme, which I believe sets a positive precedence for the rest of the sector to avoid the middlemen and the potential exploitation that may occur down the, the, down the supply chain. Uh, on the second challenge of worker empowerment, the hotel industry has also been very receptive to this approach. They already have existing grievance mechanisms, in fact, that are linked to their global headquarters, but they are now, we are in the process, in fact, of piloting our workers well for forum with one of the five-star hotels in Qatar. And we're also having in, in ongoing discussions with the ILO to figure out a way of how we can pilot different schemes and then come to one conclusion or one particular solution that could potentially be adapted uh, across the board. 
So again, I mean, we're still in the very early stages of our expanded scope. Uh, the challenges still remain, but I genuinely believe that our legacy has really started to clearly unfold. Uh, and, and in particular, this, you know, in, in an increasingly socially responsible world, uh, I think the health and well-being of employees across all sectors and industries and sound corporate governance will continue to gain prominence. And we're thrilled to be part of this journey and uh, proud of the, of the collaboration uh, that we have with many of the stakeholders that are on the call today and others as well. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Mahmoud. It's always really impressive to hear about the achievements of the Supreme Committee, but also really great to hear you talking about the challenges and how these lessons can be transferred and should be transferred to other sectors and as a legacy of the World Cup. And I have no doubt that this should also be transferred to other mega sporting events, uh, other mega developments. And it's, it's a very important, the World Cup is a very important leverage point and I think the work of the, the Supreme Committee with the workers' welfare standards, but also the repayment of fees is part of the legacy that will remain from Qatar. So it was really great to hear from the ministry and from supporters of this initiative with hotels. But I would also like to hear more about the day-to-day -day activities of the working group and what it's achieved so far. So Alex, I'll turn to you now. Um, so the working group focused on addressing different challenges faced by the sector. Um, could you tell us what was covered during the, sec the sessions and what are some of the concrete outputs that came out of these discussions? Thanks, Julia, and uh, really happy to be with uh, all our partners and also um, all of you around the world behind your screens. Um, and thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak a little bit more about uh, this working group um, on sustainable growth and the promotion of fair recruitment and employment in the hospitality sector, because I think it's quite a unique uh, initiative worldwide, uh, and I think there's uh, now we are at a stage where we have um, some lessons uh, from this experience and also would like to receive feedback. So I hope the Q&A can also be uh, an opportunity to, to discuss together how we can uh, further take this initiative forward. But um, to start, you know, when we started to focus on the hospitality sector together with all the partners today, we realized that if we wanted to see really concrete change on the ground, and if we wanted to develop some tailored tools and some very detailed guidance that would be helpful uh, in the Qatar context, um, we needed to understand firsthand what were the challenges in the hospitality sector uh, and develop the solutions with the sector. So that's, you know, there's, there's we, we were building momentum, but also ownership of everything that uh, would be developed. Hence why we created this working group. And I think at the beginning, as you said, we didn't know if this would attract interest and commitment from the sector. And we were quickly surprised uh, by, uh, in fact, the, the engagement of the sector. Now the working group is about 40 of the licensed hotels uh, in Qatar. It's about one third, um, as we heard, of the total number of hotels. So really a good representation. And it's, it's quite diverse also in terms of uh, having global brands, uh, very big hotels, but also locally owned hotels uh, and smaller hotels. So it's, 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 it's good in the, in the sense that there are also different challenges uh, that different hotels face. Um, and I think one of, of the lessons is that we, are also, we were also able to sustain the participation over those two years. Uh, usually, you know, it might be also difficult, especially now with virtual sessions, to, to continue to have the engagement of people. And we're seeing that at each session that we do, every six to eight weeks, more uh, hotels are joining. So it's, it's on a growing uh, trend. Um, one of the objectives, I think, also behind the group was really to create a level playing field with a race to the top uh, for the implementation of good practice where everyone really understand and act on the same rules. Of course, the national legislation, but also uh, in addition, looking at good practice in other sectors, uh, some of, of what uh, Mahmoud mentioned, um, and also internationally. In terms of concrete output um, of this group since two years, 
what we did is that we identify, okay, what were the key priority topic based on the concerns and the ideas from the partners of the strategic dialogue group. So this broader group of actors with partners on the call today, but also based on concerns from the industry itself. Uh, from human resources directors who deal with recruitment issue on a daily basis and, and um, also, of, of course, all the employment uh, related issues. And it came out from the different sessions that a few topics were um, at least a priority for this, this first phase. First, how to conduct uh, adequate due diligence of service providers, but also uh, including placement agencies, because as you mentioned, uh, the industry is outsourcing a lot of uh, its workforce uh, who is hired by placement agencies. And there's also many different subcontractors in the security sector, landscaping, cleaning. So it was one, one of the first really priorities. How do we look uh, efficiently at conducting due diligence uh, of service providers. Second, uh, how to conduct adequate due diligence of recruiters uh, was also a major issue uh, with workers still arriving in the sector with having paid fees. Um, and, and this was one of the key focus of, uh, of, of this part. And then two more big issues that came out uh, in the beginning, um, company grievance mechanism, how to improve esta or establish uh, uh, effective grievance mechanisms, and how to ensure that there's workers representation and participation at the enterprise level, including through the establishment of joint committees uh, that uh, Sheikha mentioned. I, so on those uh, different topics, what we did is that for each session, um, we developed a checklist or a very concrete and easy to use tool with four different things. Um, what you need to assess, uh, especially when we look at uh, the due diligence aspect, what questions to use with, for example, uh, your uh, recruitment partners in Qatar, in countries of origin, what are some of the recommended action, things that have worked, that are proven to work, both looking at good practice in Qatar, but also internationally. And then lastly, what's the legal basis and uh, national and international guidance that support that so that everyone was clear again on where this was coming from. And all those tools that were developed in those sessions were summarized in, in a guidance uh, tool that was launched with um, uh, the Ministry of Labor, the Qatar Chamber and IHRB uh, last year. Um, and it's, the aim is really to be a simple tool that can be used on a daily basis and can become really one of the key documents on the, on the desk of human resource directors on those uh, topics. And then lastly, uh, you ask, uh, can the guidance tool uh, be useful also for other sectors? What's the potential for replicability? I think there's a clear potential for, for replicability. Um, first, in two different ways. First, um, this tool was inspired by other initiatives. Uh, Ambet mentioned um, our joint pilot with QDVC um, in the construction sector. Through the pilot, we developed uh, some, for example, standard clauses to include in contracts uh, with recruitment agencies to ensure that it's very clearly stated that workers should not pay any fees, to ensure that recruitment costing is very clear and uh, with uh, possible penalties between partners if uh, responsibilities are not respected. So these are things, for example, that we used uh, in the guidance tool with the hospitality sector. So this tool was inspired from other initiatives in other sectors. And at the same time, I think that now the tool is, is, um, is can really be helpful for other sectors because some of the, um, so some of the challenges it addresses really are quite similar across sector. For example, when you take due diligence of recruitment agencies, often in Qatar and in countries of origin, recruitment partners recruit for several sectors. They do not only recruit for the hospitality sector. Usually they would really tackle different sectors. So the challenges are quite uh, similar and, um, and that's why we think there's a big potential for, for use of this tool in other sectors.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. And I think this is a really great overview. And, you know, so much has been achieved in the last three years, despite the challenges of also moving to virtual meetings. And I think everyone is still learning how to adapt and how to uh, continue to build the relationship of trust through virtual engagements. So you mentioned that um, participation is still increasing in the group. Um, so what do you see for the way forward? What are your expectations for the group? Um, that we have still many expectations. Uh, I think this first phase was um, a very interesting experience, uh, but that needs to be consolidated uh, in, in a second phase. Um, we've done a, sur a survey recently where a bit more than half of the hotels participating in the group uh, responded, which shows um, clearly that I mean, pretty much most of the hotel thought that really all the sessions were quite helpful in terms of providing very concrete guidance uh, that then um, allowed them to adapt their procedures. Uh, I think they mentioned that the checklists were quite concrete and helpful, but also that there's, I think, a need for more and more session of dialogue, uh, for example, with the Ministry of Labor. What we've been doing between some of the more thematic session is to organize some Q&A with the Ministry of Labor, where hotels could ask any questions of clarification on the labor law, going to the different employment and recruitment matters. And we've seen that there's a clear need for more clarity on some of the legislation, but also on the new legislation. Uh, as um, uh, my colleagues here mentioned, there's been some really groundbreaking labor reforms being adopted in the last three years. Uh, and uh, there's a clear need for more awareness uh, on those different laws. So we've been also using this platform of the working group to share the new rules and make sure that if there are any questions, they can be clarified for quick implementation. Um, in terms of the topics, uh, I think what is needed is first to continue with looking at other priorities. Uh, we have, for example, a session in the pipeline on uh, prevention and addressing violence and harassment at work. So new identified priorities by the sector, but also going back to some of the uh, some of the topic that we uh, tackled already to dive more into details, for example, the question on recruitment costs and how to do uh, a full mapping in countries of origin and in Qatar of all the costs so that it's easier to see who must cover between the employer and the recruiters and how do you share uh, those different co costing uh, between employer and recruiter is important. Um, then in the second phase, um, I think we want to um, obviously see very concrete changes of policies, of procedures, of practices. This first phase was focused on dialogue. And in the second phase, we want to start to document also much more uh, concrete changes by hotels. Um, we also think that there's a, a a space in this second phase to look also at replication in other countries uh, together with the Qatari stakeholders um, because a lot of the hotels that are part of the working group are global brands that have a presence in other countries uh, and so how can this working group inspire other working groups in other uh, uh, countries I think that would be interesting to look at because when a hotel in Qatar especially a, a global brand is changing some of the policies and procedures on due diligence of recruitment, it directly affects, for example, the, the global due diligence procedure of this hotel. And hopefully it can have also this local to global uh, uh, influence and impact. Um, and lastly, um, there's, uh, as Sheikha mentioned, there's one pilot underway to establish a, a joint committee in a hotel. Uh, I understand there's also some pilots um, on, on workers' welfare forums uh, with the Supreme Committee in the hospitality sector. It's really something that uh, we would like to see a boost also in the second phase so that really more hotels uh, um, established uh, joint committees. And my last point, um, Julia, is, you know, when we look at this working group, um, I think we also need to insist on the fact that 
uh, this working group, which is based on voluntary participation. It's not an isolated initiative. It's carefully framed into a broader program of reforms uh, that also prioritizes the improvement of monitoring of recruitment, monitoring of working and living conditions with the re reinforcement, for example, of the labor inspection capacity, uh, but also looking at how to embed better labor rights, including fair recruitment into public clients, uh, public procurement procedures, so that we also give uh, incentives to hotel to, to comply, obviously, with national legislation, but also uh, adopt a good and best practice. Um, and uh, the work, obviously, on continuing uh, to, to work on the legal framework that has changed a lot in the past three years. Uh, so continuing to work on, on implementation and also uh, continuous progress uh, on the legal side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. This was really helpful. And there's certainly a lot of work going forward, uh, but it all sounds extremely exciting and important. And I think uh, I'm conscious of time, but I want to make sure we have enough time to give the voice and the floor to a hotel. Uh, I think we've been talking about the sector for the whole session and we haven't heard from the ones who actually participated and hopefully benefited from this working group. So Rana, um, I'm again conscious of time, so I'm gonna sort of combine two questions to you. We mentioned some of the challenges that the industry faces, especially with um, relationship with uh, placement agencies and engagement of temporary workers and other challenges that were mentioned. So can you talk a little bit more about some of these challenges? And my second question is, the work of the working group has focused on engagement with human resources directors. And for us, and I can speak for IHRB, this has been an extremely valuable experience. Um, it has been very different than engaging with sustainability teams. And we know that even communication within companies can be a challenge. So, you know, for you, what are some of the benefits of engaging with human resources directors directly? Thank you, over to you, Rana. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Julia. Um, well, to start with, as you said, um, in, in the hospitality, the uh, guest satisfaction is the uh, prime focus uh, and um, achieving the guest satisfaction is, is usually uh, our ultimate uh, goal. However, we've noticed over the past years, the consumer behavior has shifted and changed as well as the employees' behaviors have changed. Um, and therefore, we we had to work in, in, in different, and this impacted the management and even the uh, marketing of, of hotels and the way we work. Um, when it comes to challenges, um, and specifically challenges of um, for the human resources, uh, we talk about, you know, um, challenges like attracting and uh, retaining the talents. Uh, we talk about the high turnover and definitely, which is more relevant to our uh, session today, is the unethical uh, recruitment uh, practices. Um, when we talk about, you know, uh, the um, attracting and retaining the, um, uh, the, the, the talents, it's um, as the industry continues to develop, retaining and attracting the top talents um, is a priority and to edge out the competition, we have to ensure that we're recruiting the top um, uh, skills. Uh, however, sometimes it's um, easier uh, said than, uh, than done. Uh, for various reasons, it can be uh, the location, it can be uh, local legislations, it can be uh, budget constraints, um, different different kind of uh, uh, reasons. Um, the employee retention as well is a, another uh, significant uh, challenge, uh, which is actually regardless of the sector, it's not only specifically for the hospitality. Um, so hotels, uh, we need to develop um, techniques how to retain uh, the skills and the talents, uh, such as, for, for example, focusing on uh, referral-based hires. Um, uh, also, it can be uh, adopting processes where um, employees' uh, productivity and uh, morale uh, um, uh, are boosted, um, uh, favorable working schedules, incentives, different kind of um, uh, 
techniques. The unethical recruitment practices, I mean, it's not a surprise that migrant workers uh, were being denied the rights, uh, whether it's from um, paying the illegal recruitment charges or even when they are here, um, the uh, not filling or fulfilling uh, the contracts. Um, however, um, I have to say, I mean, and especially for the hotels, because we have two different kinds of, um, we're dealing with uh, when we when we talk about the unethical recruitment, because part of uh, one is um, the recruitment agencies that sometimes we have to deal with to bring our own uh, employees, and the other part of it is the placement agencies and the what we call the seasonal or on call um, employees that we sometimes use uh, for the um, hotel operations, and um, two are. Uh, similar yet different um, in the way that we, 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 we need to deal with them. And definitely, I have to say, I mean, the, uh, the work that we had um, with, uh, with the ministry and with the ILO has been very uh, valuable because um, it did uh, streamline the practices uh, and the processes um, uh, with, the, with, the, with those specifically with the unethical recruitment uh, uh, part. Uh, when the working group started its collaboration, it was to address various uh, labor rights challenges that the industry was facing um, in terms of easily identifying and institutionalizing the labor rights by uh, employers from the hospitality industry. And it's understandable because, um, as even mentioned by uh, Alex, sometimes the labor laws offer general frame framework, um, uh, which all national sectors abide, and it's not industry by industry. And therefore, uh, sometimes we do need the clarity um, for uh, some specifics when it comes to the uh, hospitality. Uh, as it has been working on all what we've done, actually, or the work that we've done, um, has been, uh, you know, a significant part of the, um, uh, you know, the equation and what we need when it comes to uh, the unethical recruitment. And it was great because um, it was not uh, the the way that it was done. It uh, instead of drilling down like a, a top down list of regulations. Um, they chose to work with us, with the stakeholders, to build the guidelines and regulations from within uh, with the people that we are uh, most familiar, I would say, with these pressing issues. Uh, so all different stakeholders were present, whether it's the government, whether it's the, uh, the, uh, from the, um, uh, the ministry or us as representatives from the industry or even the employees as well. So being a member of this working group um, and having these guidelines actually was was a, was definitely um, a, a privilege. Uh, the guidelines really uh, and talking from the field and from the experience uh, had a lot in terms of uh, putting uh, the proper rules and regulations, how to uh, minimize and eliminate the unethical recruitment um, and putting uh, our own procedures and um, guidelines, how to deal with um, the recruitment agencies or the placement agencies. Definitely, it's not easy, uh, especially uh, in the beginning, um, mandating rules and uh, new clauses in the contracts and uh, asking to audit uh, some of the companies uh, was definitely uh, not an easy task um, and it took um, several meetings and discussions with these companies and sometimes it took um, us actually to have like a firm uh, stance on where on where we are and then our standards um, and, you know, we had to reach uh, to a certain level where these are our standards and we do not want to partner with any company that would not actually live up to, um, to those um, standards. Thank you so much, Rana. And it's so valuable to hear your insights from the ground and how the working group has been helpful and, you know, I still have so many questions to ask about the pandemic that has hit hospitality so badly. And also so many good questions from the audience, but unfortunately we don't have any time remaining because there is another session starting in an hour. 
Uh, that was certainly not the intention. These are very important questions, and I'm seeing here some topics, um, very important ones. What is being done uh, with subcontractors? What are the hotels actually doing? Um, what is the role of the Qatar government in uh, being a driver for change in, in this process? And many other excellent questions. But we'll make sure to post these on our social wall, and I encourage you to keep an eye on it. And we'll also ask all the speakers to provide written responses if possible. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our wonderful panel. And I wish we had more time to discuss, um, but there are also some resources being shared in the chat box. And I encourage people to take a look at this. And thank you everyone for your participation. Thank you.